So I'll read just two pages of the second chapter to introduce the other characters, uh, Helen and Jennifer, Galen's aunt and uh, cousin. We're setting up the comedy. We've got uh, everyone getting along well and heading toward the, the, uh, the happy ending. Um, it's so funny. I had a, a review on Sunday in the San Francisco Chronicle, and I loved it. It, it was great, and the person likes tragedy. And um, I just had one in the Boston Globe today where it's a, a common complaint that I get from uh, U.S. reviewers. Um, there's no happy ending. It didn't all come together. <laughs> Which is bizarro. I mean, in Europe, I would never get a review like that. And for 2,500 years, we've been writing tragedy. Like, really, stuff's been falling apart for 2,500 years. <laughs> but America's going to buck the trend. We're going to have everything come together. Because um, everything's working out so well for us. <laughs> we want it to be a mirror, I suppose, of, of that glorious, uh, triumphant ending we're experiencing now. Okay. When Galen and his mother returned home, Galen's aunt and cousin were waiting. His aunt standing at the door, his cousin Jennifer slouched in the wooden love seat under the oak tree, like gangsters. Galen's mother pulled up behind their crap Oldsmobile. His mother went to the door, and Galen walked over to his cousin, this oak tree with limbs stretching out fifty feet in every direction. They played here as kids, played endless hours with Barbies and G.I. Joes in the shade. Hey, Jennifer said. Galen tried not to look, but she had one foot up on the bench, knee bent high in a short skirt, and he could see her panties, light blue, could see the smooth skin of her thigh. She was 17, and he'd been taking peaks like this for at least four years now, unbearable. He looked down at the ground, at the grass that was up to his shins. Hey, she said, you're looking good. So hot. I love you. I'm never going to take a shower again, look. The homeless are so sexy. You take enough showers for both of us. True, she said. I like how soft my skin feels afterward. She ran her fingers along her inner thigh. It's unbelievable, she said. Do you want to feel? <laughs> Stop it, he said, and he walked away into the house. The parlor, cool and dark, the shades drawn, and he stood in place a moment at the bottom of the stairs. The baby grand that no one knew how to play. The old photos on the walls, the wide, dusty planks. He creaked up the steps to his room and locked the door, pulled out a Hustler magazine and lay on his bed. And I have my mother-in-law here and several other relatives. So it's like getting a little comfortable for me, but it's all right, I'm doing okay. okay. The pleasure the same as despair, a deep and awful need, and his imagination terrible. Some sorrow, the world of suffering. So he put the magazine down, stopped moving his hand, left his dick hard. That's, that would have been a better line to leave out. Uh, he took his tape recorder off the nightstand, put the headphones on, listened to Kataro. Closed his eyes to camels in the desert, long journeys across sand and wind and time. Felt his spirit reaching across lifetimes, across incarnations. Felt freedom, this body only a dream. The banging at his door, though, was not a dream, and finally he had to take off the headphones. I'm coming, he yelled, Jesus, the world's not going to end if we don't have dinner. Um, and then it has actually kind of a horrific little scene there, but I will I'll stop there. and I'll read a, a very short five-page chapter from later. Um, I should say first that uh, the, the name of the character, Galen, comes from the name of my best friend in high school up in Santa Rosa. Uh, this character is really more me than Galen, though, and he was very nice in letting me use the name, and he saw an early version of the book and such. Um, but it was, uh, it was fun. The, the title, Dirt, is actually the meditation that Galen finds. He thought that water was going to be his meditation, like Siddhartha's meditation, but instead finds that it's dirt. Um, and there's a bit of a contrast between him getting close to enlightenment and what's actually going on. Uh, there's an, an increasing divide. And, and so it was fun to write. I mean, I, I, there's some strange things that happen in the landscape with the walnut orchard and, and the shadows of the trees and everything kind of coming alive. And he's, he's shamanic in one moment, and he's Buddhist in another. And it was just really fun. I had a great time with it. I actually can never think of the book without... Uh, uh, sort of chuckling, um, but it's it's the parts I can't read you because I would give away what happens. It's like all the second half of the book mostly. So sorry I can't really go there. Um, yeah, because there's something that happens, and then everything else is predicated on that. So no scene makes any sense if you don't know that thing. So that's the weird part about reading from a novel. I will say that my next book um, is. Um, Set in California also. I had two books set in Alaska with these cold landscapes. Now it's two books with hot, burning landscapes. And the next book is um, 
uh, said on the hunting ranch that we went to in about a couple hours north of Lakeport into the mountains, so a few hours north of here. And uh, that one, it was a hunting ranch we went to every fall. And my father let me look at poachers through the scope of his 300 Magnum bear rifle whenever we'd see them. So I'd be looking at them through the crosshairs with the shell in the chamber. And we did this a lot. It's like a fairly common occurrence. And uh, so the kid pulls the trigger, which is something I always thought about uh, during those times back then when I was like 10 years old looking through the scope at somebody. And uh, so that causes problems uh, for the others. <laughs> and it gets closer. This gets pretty close to Greek tragedy and dramatic unities in that it's five characters over 10 days and mostly just two locations. There's a little bit of the rest home, but it's mostly this house in Walnut Orchard and then the cabin. The next one is just two and a half days, a hunting trip gone awry with only four characters just on the side of the mountain with no escape, uh, no distractions. What I like about these limited settings, and the last one, Caribou Island, too, is on an island with a couple uh, marriage not going well after 30 years and they're building a cabin together, which seems like a great idea if you're not getting along. Uh, what I like about that is that uh, what drama does really is, is uh, put characters under pressure until they break. Like, that's really the point of it. They're, it's a pressure cooker and they, they can't get out. And, um, and so the, the next one, Goat Mountain, does that even more, actually. But this, the whole second half, is just Galen and his mother. And it's definitely, and it's in one place, it's over a couple days, and it's, uh, it's the pressure cooker. So I'm sorry I can't give you a little bit of, of taste from the pressure cooker. Uh, instead, we only have hors d'oeuvres from the, from the first half. All right, so this is up at the cabin. The first sentence, dinner was not chicken and dumplings. There's been a lot of lead-up to the chicken and dumplings dinner that the grandmother always prepares. Okay, <laughs> dinner was not chicken and dumplings. That would come later, when it could cook all day in the stew pot. Dinner tonight was a tuna casserole, a jar of mayonnaise, several large cans of tuna, a large bag of potato chips, and squares of American cheese on top. That's an actual family recipe. So don't use it unless you credit us. It was so gross. I had it over and over my childhood. It's unbelievable. I just have to read it once more. A jar of mayonnaise, several large cans of tuna, a large bag of potato chips, and squares of American cheese on top. You've really gone all out, Galen said. Galen's mother was just setting the casserole in a hot pad in the center of the small table. The kitchen was tiny, and they were all elbow to elbow. You've used an entire bag of potato chips, Galen said. Do you have any idea how much salt that is? He was already starting to sweat. The cast iron stove emanated an incredible heat. They had the windows and back door open, but that wasn't enough. Maybe it's time to throw away the white trash cookbook, Galen said. His mother grabbed his upper arm hard, pinching the skin, and yanked him out of his seat. Susie Q, his grandmother said, and his mother let go. He sat back down. Are we white trash, he asked. I'm never going to college, and none of us have jobs, and here we are out in the woods. Next thing you know, I'll be sleeping with my cousin, which of course he is doing <laughs> by this point. <laughs> uh, stop, Galen said. That's, that's his cousin's mother. Uh, Jennifer narrowed her eyes and then looked down at her plate. Maybe this was how he could have some power over her. Maybe she needed everything kept a secret more than he did. This isn't you, Galen, his grandmother said. Your grandfather designed a bridge in Sacramento. You're a Schumacher, and you can always be proud of that. Sorry, Grandma. A pile of mush on everyone's plate. The wilted potato chips, golden and oily. Men are the problem, Helen said. First dad and now you. You won't talk to my son that way, Galen's mother said. Weren't you just trying to rip his arm off? He's not like Dad. But I thought Dad was perfect. I thought he drank lemonade and had lovely lunches under the fig tree. Isn't it good to be like Dad? What happened to that whole story? Your father was a good man, Galen's grandmother said. He worked hard all his life. Yeah, we know, Helen said. No, you don't. You don't seem to understand. He provided for all of us. I would rather not have been born, Helen said. Seriously. I would rather have skipped the entire miserable fuck job of a life this has been. Helen. I'm serious, and again, it's kind of a little bummer to have relatives here. Uh, potty mouth, you know, I'm a potty mouth in real life, but I try, at least in public appearances, to stray away from that. Um, but we have to be faithful to the text. <laughs> um, Helen, I'm serious, and I'm not putting up with your lies anymore. Why are you giving everything to Susie? Why are you giving nothing to me and nothing to Jennifer? I want to know, Mom. Wow, Galen said, you can kick some ass when you get on a roll. Galen's aunt punched him in the shoulder hard. She punched him again, looking him right in the eyes, pure hatred, and punched him again. He tried to block, but she was fast, and she hit hard. And then the strangest thing happened. 
Everyone looked away. No one said or did anything in response to the fact that his aunt had just punched him. His grandmother was humming to herself, looking down at her lap, and his mother was eating. Jennifer had crossed her arms and was looking down also. His aunt had gone back to eating. And what Galen realized was that this was the first time he'd been punched, but everyone else in this room must have been punched many times before. Or in his mother's case, maybe she had only been a witness to it, but a witness many times. Mm -hmm. Galen's shoulder was throbbing, but he served himself some tuna casserole and tried to eat a couple bites. The sound of the fire in the stove, popping of coals, the sounds of chewing and swallowing, wet and amplified, the taste of salt. Well, he said, I guess this is who we are. Would you like some more casserole, Mom? His mother asked. Thank you, yes, this is very good. Galen's mother made a show of serving the casserole, raising the spoon high. Tomorrow we'll have your chicken and dumplings, Mom. That will be such a treat. Galen could see his mother was the reconstructor of worlds. That was her role. When all fell apart, she stepped in and made time move again. Tomorrow we can take a walk down to Camp Sacramento, she said. Oh, that would be nice, his grandmother said. I'm still waiting for an answer, Mom, Helen said. Would you like some wine, Mom, Galen's mother asked. Yes, please. Galen's mother stood and turned to the counter beside the stove. There was no space in this room. The five of them bunched around three sides of a tiny old table that was built into the wall, covered in a yellow plastic tablecloth. The walls on even planks, painted white, a single bare bulb with a chain, the floor a faded brown linoleum, the stove like a furnace, all their faces wet with sweat. Galen's mother opened a bottle of white wine, Riesling, which is what the grandfather drank, and the smell brought Galen instantly back. She poured glasses for herself and her mother and didn't offer to anyone else. The two of them drank and ate while Galen and the Mafia watched, and Galen wondered why they were all together here. What's the point of trying to be a family, he asked. Why are we doing it? Galen's mother sighed and downed the rest of her glass, then refilled it. Galen's grandmother was staring at her own wine with a kind of wonder. She had rested it, nearly empty, on the table, just beyond her plate. The stem between two fingers, she was swirling it gently, her hand facing downward, open, as if she were waving her palm over something, as if the table were a looking glass and the wine upon it a kind of golden key. She looked mesmerized, her blue eyes wet and large, her lips moving slightly, as if she were reciting some invocation, something from long ago, something none of the rest of them would understand. She seemed about to announce something, and this was what kept the rest of them silent. The bare bulb in its harsh light made it seem that if you removed his grandmother, you'd have to cut her from the fabric of the world, and there'd be a hole left. Each of them felt that way to Galen, as if all were two-dimensional, flattened, and lodged in place. Jennifer, with her arms still folded, looking down, unmoving, stationary, his mother with deeper lines around her mouth than he had noticed before, as if her lips were separate from the rest of her face, something added, her eyes buried in sockets too large, the waves of her hair something sculpted and not attached. She looked fabricated, put together in pieces, invented. Galen felt the unreality of her, felt it for the first time as something immediate and undeniable. She raised her glass again to her lips, but even that movement was jointed. The world put together with some kind of ratcheting action, each piece pulled into place under tension, all of it threatening to snap. Galen wanted to leave. He wanted to get away from this table. This table felt extremely dangerous. He understood now that what held his family together was violence. But he was locked here, glued in place, unable to move. He could only watch, and the only movement was his, was his mother's glass and his grandmother's glass and palm moving in its slow circles and the wavering of the light.